Good morning and welcome to the Committee on Rules, Privileges and Elections. My name is Karen Koslowitz and I am chair of this committee. Before we begin this hearing, I would like to introduce the council members of this committee who have joined us today. First, we are honored that our speaker, Corey Johnson, who was a member of this committee, has joined us. The other members of this committee who, present, who are present are Minority Leader Stephen Matteo, Council Member Adrian Adams. Is Adrian here? Council Member, uh, Margaret Chin's not here. Council Member Robert Kornicke, Jr. Council Member Raphael Espinal. Council Member Vanessa Gibson. Council Member Rory Lansman. Council Member Richie Torres and Council Member Mark Traeger. I would also like to acknowledge Rules Committee Council Elizabeth Guzman and the staff members of the Council's investiga Investigative Unit, Chuck Davis, Director of Investigations, and Andre Johnson Brown, Investigator. Today, the Rules Committee will consider two nominations for appointment. We will consider and vote on the appointment of Dr. Mitchell Katz to the New York Board of Health. We will then consider and vote on the appointment of Mr. Nathan N. Joseph to the Civilian Complaint Re Review Board. We will now consider the nomination of Dr. Mitchell Katz, and I would like to ask the speaker if he would like to say a few words. Uh, thank you, Chair Kozlowitz. Uh, welcome uh, to both of you. Thanks for being here uh, this morning. Um, I wanted to, uh, do you guys have opening statements you wanted to deliver this morning or no? Yes, okay, so I'll ask my questions after the opening statements. I wanna give you the opportunity uh, to make those before I make a statement. Okay. Okay, we will now consider the nomination of Dr. Mitchell Katz to the New York City Board of Health. The primary function of the Board of Health is to legislate and oversee New York City Health Code, which encompasses the rules governing all matters and subjects within the jurisdiction of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. The, the Department of Health's jurisdiction is among the most extensive and varied of all of the city agencies. Hence, Board of Health members legislate in a wide variety of health areas, subject areas include communicable diseases, environmental health services, mental health and disabilities, alcoholism and substance abuse, radiological health, food safety, veterinarian affairs, water quality, pest control, and vital statistics. The fact that New York City Health Code rules have the force and effect of law and cover such an extensive range of measures aimed at improving the physical and mental well-being of New Yorkers highlights the importance of the work of the Board of Health and consequently the vital need for crucial consideration of all potential appointments. The Board of Health's 11 members serve six-year terms without pay and akin to judges cannot be dismissed without court. I'd like to welcome Dr. Katz, and can you please raise your right hand to be sworn in? Hello, Dr. Katz. Um, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and the testimony you are about to give today? Thank you. Okay. Do you wish to make an opening statement? statement? Uh, good morning. I'm Dr. Mitch Katz. Thank you to Chair Koslowitz, Speaker Johnson, and the members of the Rules Committee for considering my nomination to the Department of Health. I was born in Brooklyn, and I'm a product of the New York City Public Schools. I went to medical school to be a primary care doctor. I attended medical school and completed a residency in the worst years of the AIDS epidemic in San Francisco, a city hit as hard as New York City. Uh, the epidemic thrust me into leadership roles in the San Francisco Department of Public Health, where with colleagues we built cutting-edge uh, programs and services, including publicly funding needle exchange in the face of opposition. 
I ran the San Francisco Department of Public Health for 13 years and was proudest of creating the first universal health access program, Healthy San Francisco, housing 1,300 homeless persons suffering from physical or mental illness and rebuilding our two hospitals. I left San Francisco to run the Los Angeles County Department of Health Services, the second largest public health system in the country. There, my team expanded primary care, housed over 4,000 homeless persons suffering from illness, and created My Health LA, a health access program for low-income uninsured persons. During my last two years, we created a health agency to integrate the functions of health services, categorical public health, and mental health services so as to deliver better care to individuals and programs to the community. I was honored to be asked to return to my hometown of New York City to run health and hospitals. I know I'm in the right place because just on the walk here in the five minutes, I was asked for directions three times. Where's Greenwich Street? Where's Duane and Lafayette? And where do I go with my immigration papers? So I must, I must look and, and act like I belong back in, in New York City. Health and Hospitals is an amazing organization that cares for the neediest and most vulnerable New Yorkers, many of whom are immigrants, including ones who are undocumented. We run 11 acute care hospitals, five skilled nursing facilities, and provide ambulatory care in 70 other locations. Uh, one of the newest I was so proud to be with Councilwoman Rose in Staten Island to open Vanderbilt. Uh, throughout my career, I've practiced as both an inpatient and an outpatient physician. Uh, I'll be seeing primary care patients this afternoon at Gouverneur. I, I also receive my health care at Health and Hospitals uh, because I believe that our health care system should be good enough for all of us to use it. Uh, I believe that the tools of health service and public health are synergistic in improving the, the health of a city. As CEO of Health and Hospitals, I know intimately the pressing needs of New Yorkers for health care. Because we serve primarily vulnerable populations, we have special insight into the disparities that engulf our society. Public health, through its tools of epidemiology and assessment, health education and promotion, community engagement and intervention, sanitation, program development and regulation, can prevent health problems as well as develop community-wide solutions to health problems. Thank you for this opportunity, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to now turn it over to the speaker. Uh, thank you, Dr. Katz, and thank you again, uh, Chair Kozlowitz. I want to welcome you, and it's, I look forward to uh, meeting with you one-on-one -on -one soon. Uh, one thing that you mentioned in your opening remarks is, of course, your 13-year tenure in San Francisco and how proud you are of uh, helping create Healthy San Francisco, which you talked about housing 1,300 homeless persons uh, who are suffering. I, I want uh, to hear if you have any uh, thoughts on trying to come up with a similar model for New York City. I know our healthcare landscape is slightly different with the number of, of course, public hospitals and non-public hospitals in New York City. But if you have, I know this position, of course, is for uh, the Board of Health, but I still would love to hear your thoughts on uh, coming up with a similar model and working with this administration and using the resources at health and hospitals to formulate a similar model, uh, anything that could be analogous to Healthy San Francisco uh, on trying to create this. I believe, of course, that uh, healthcare should be a human right and that we need to help all uninsured people, especially those uh, who are suffering the most as someone who is HIV positive and someone uh, who has gone without health insurance at certain points in my life. Uh, to me, uh, you know, it's very personal. So I wanted to, to hear how, how you would talk about trying to create a similar model to Healthy San Francisco here in New York City. Uh, well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you for speaking out for all people who are uninsured. Uh, I very much uh, believe, as you do, that there should be a, a program, a comprehensive program for people who are uninsured and who cannot gain insurance that includes everything from outpatient visits and inpatient visits and pharmacy and laboratory services, and we're able to create that in both San Francisco and Los Angeles. Uh, the, the two programs were different in each place, and so I figure what New York will need will also be different. Um, and I'm looking forward to working with you and your colleagues on uh, designing what that would be. Health and hospitals absolutely is in. 
Um, we provide a lot of services to this group, but it isn't always as organized. And that uh, really what Healthy San Francisco did and um, My Health LA did is organize it, make it sure that everybody knew where they could go, that they had pharmacy coverage, that they had a card, that they had a member services number. And I would love for that to exist in New York City. Uh, and I think that the, the health department had a, a very successful effort with Action Health. And I think that the combination of the pilot data from Action Health and what Health and Hospitals is currently doing can together create a program that people would very much support. Uh, do you support personally? I'm not talking about uh, as a member of the Board of Health, but I just want to know your personal opinion. Do you support a single payer health care program? Yes. And uh, according to Gay Men's Health Crisis, despite the declining rate of new infections per year, uh, New York still leads the nation in uh, the number of new HIV cases. So I wanted to hear uh, your priorities with respect to addressing HIV infection and HIV treatment in our city. Uh, well, thank you. And obviously, like you, I've spent my life working on this issue. Um, the, we have some better tools um, than what we used to have. I think that probably making sure that every person who is positive is offered treatment is probably the single most effective prevention tool we have because we know when people are undetectable, um, the chances of them transmitting the, the virus are vanishingly small. And so trying to reach everyone and while um, there is amazing treatment uh, in New York. There are also areas where people remain out of treatment um, and trying to get those people into treatment I think makes a, a tremendous amount of sense. Well, I have a lot more questions, but I, I don't want to take up uh, time this morning. I know other colleagues may have questions. Uh, I look forward to supporting your uh, nomination to the Board of Health. I look forward to working with you in your position, of course, at Health and Hospitals and on the issues that I outlined today very briefly. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Council Member Torres. Thank you, Ms. Uh, um, Dr. Katz. First, I just want to say, and I said it to you in private, that I'm a product of Jacoby, and for you to take on the challenge of managing the seminal safety net institution in our city, facing the deficits that you do is a enormous tribute to your public service. So, Thank you. As I'm sure you've read in the papers, much has been said and written about lead poisoning uh, and exposure in public housing. And I want to know, as, as someone who's going to become a member of the policy-making board for the Department of Health, do you feel the Department of Health historically has done enough to protect children in public housing from lead exposure and lead poisoning? Well, Councilman, in some ways, we can never do enough because we know how harmful lead is, especially to the intellectual development of young children. Um, and the fact that any of our, you know, people are living in substandard housing should offend all of us. Uh, I look forward to working with the, with the Department of Public Health. I think there are a lot of proactive solutions about getting remediation, getting people into safe housing, um, and that we need to do those things speedily before children have that intellectual loss. And, you know, we've come to discover that there was a discrepancy between the city standard of lead safety and the CDC standard of lead safety, but for the CDC, the recommended threshold for public intervention was blood lead level of five milligrams per deciliter. Yet the city's policy was to intervene when there was a blood lead level of 10 milligrams per deciliter, with few exceptions. Um, did, I found that troubling, that there was a whole universe of children whom the federal government regarded as possessing a hazardously high levels of lead exposure, but for whom there was no public health intervention from the city. Uh, do you share my concerns about that discrepancy? I, I do, and I understand the Department of Public Health has changed that and that they are now intervening. And again, I think that really we shouldn't be tolerating lead levels in our children, right? And we, right, I mean, that's not a normal constituent of the, 
the child's blood. And so our efforts should be trying to make sure the children are not exposed and as quickly as possible, uh, certainly at five, that we are able to you know, do intervention to get that kid out of that situation or to remediate immediately the apartment. So as you rightly point out, there is a new policy of conducting home investigations. When any child under the age of 18 has a blood lead level of five milligrams per deciliter or higher, but the CDC has noted that there is no safe amount of lead exposure. So what should we do when a child has four milligrams, a blood lead level of four, three, or two milligrams per deciliter? What's the appropriate public health right. interaction in those cases? Well, Council Members, we're saying I, I, I agree with that. It's not a safe constituent in the blood of children. It doesn't have a safe level. It's not okay, right? Children's blood should not have lead. Um, obviously, the higher that is, the more likely you are to get serious harm. Um, but I think that, that when it's detectable, you have to ask yourself, why is there lead in this kid's blood? And I think that, that sending out resources, because even if it's below a detection level, does that prove that it won't ultimately be higher if the child has more exposures going into the future? Um, so I think that whenever kids have detectable lead levels, you know, we're, we're not talking about, you know, giving them a harmful treatment, right? All we're talking about is that if kids have lead, we want to figure out why they have lead, right? I mean, that seems like a fairly straightforward issue. We're not harming the children. It's not a question of uh, weighing the risks of treatment, right? All we're saying is a kid has lead in their blood. Kids should not have lead in the blood. We need to go out and find out why the kid has lead in their blood. And so you agree there should be some action taken even if it's below five yeah. milligrams per deciliter? Yes. And, and one concern I have, I know the mayor said it, my understanding is that the mayor set aside $10 million to support the home investigations under the new policy, but we're going from 700 cases to 5,000 cases. And so I have concerns about whether the $10 million that the mayor has set aside is sufficient to support what is a 700% increase in the, in the home investigation caseload of the Department of Health. So I hope that's an issue that you can monitor. Uh, separately, just one more question. Um, you might have read in the Daily News that uh, Montefiore Medical Center uh, had severe overcrowding, has a severe overcrowding in its emergency room and has a practice of stacking patients in the hallways. And I suspect it's a practice that extends beyond Montefiore. First, is that a practice that's common among your hospitals? And second, do you see a role for the Board of Health in curbing the practice of hallway placements, which you know, strip patients of privacy for toileting, intimate interviews, physical exams? It's ruinous to the patient experience. What are your responses to those two questions? Councilman, it's a difficult issue that I've struggled with since I worked at San Francisco General Hospital now 25 years ago. Um, no. Patients should not be in hallways. Patients should be in rooms where they have appropriate privacy. That being said, people need to be treated, right? And you, can't, you also don't want people with serious illness sitting in an unmonitored space in the waiting room. So you somehow have to weigh the, the pluses and minuses of moving more people in or going on diversion, which is another tool people use, but when you go on diversion, meaning you close the ED because you have too many patients, then people wind up farther away from their families and they away from their medical records. So that, too, is a very imperfect solution. Um, I would like to work with you and, and your colleagues in Montefiore on, you know, trying to get at root causes uh, of this. I think there needs to be a lot more primary care in the Bronx, for one thing. Uh, there's no question that people go to the ED because of the lack of availability of accessible care. And to me, care is not accessible if it's only open 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. None of us would accept that if we called the airlines and said we wanted to fly, you know, cross country, and they said Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. Why do we accept that from our medical system? You know, I'm a big pusher that H&H &H has to go to evening clinics and Saturday clinics and Sunday clinics because people work. And not everybody, as you know, has sick leave. Yeah. A lot of why people go to the ED is because you can go in the evening, right? You can go on the weekends. You don't have to take time off from work. So I, think, I don't think it's a simple issue. 
Um, I also want to put in a plug for the importance of NCB. A lot of people uh, you know, told me, consultants before I came, well, why do you need NCB? And one of the things I, when I, so I made it my point to go to NCB, NCB, I'm sorry, North Central Bronx Hospital, has 40,000 outpatient visits, uh, excuse me, emergency room visits. Well, where would those visits happen if NCB was not there? So I think trying to build up North Central Bronx uh, is another way that we can help to make sure that people get care in a timely way. Well, I care deeply, but an NCBH is underutilized. Yes, as a, as a physical structure, and it's and, right next to Montefiore. And it's next, so should Montefiore divert more patients to NCBH since it's underutilized? Well, I think we could work that out. So is that something that you would take yes. on as both the head of health, the hospitals and as a member of the Board of Health? Yes, and as someone who cares about patients. I just want to reiterate just one more. Are, how common are hallway placements in your facilities? Hallway placements? Hallway placements. I would say, you know, I've, I've been to every single emergency department we have. I would say that about two-thirds of them have enough room space okay. so that it doesn't happen. I'd say about a third of them, when it gets busy, they bring people in. And again, I'm, I would have to support that because I couldn't support them being in the waiting room if they needed to be monitored, at least in the hallway. It, while imperfect, they get nursing, they get medical attention. I thank you for your answers. Thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. Council Member Traeger. Thank you, Chair, thank you, Speaker, my colleagues, and uh, congratulations on your nomination. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Katz, I'm, I'm Councilman Traeger. I represent uh, Coney Island neighborhoods in southern Brooklyn. Uh, just to uh, give you uh, some, some context, uh, we are, even though it's now a number of years uh, from Sandy, we're still, we're still in recovery mode from Superstorm Sandy. Uh, when I took office, uh, we actually did not uh, see any um, firm commitment from FEMA to help rebuild Coney Island Hospital and hospitals that were severely, severely damaged uh, by that storm. Uh, what frustrated me was that we were seeing uh, faster F FEMA commitments and progress uh, with regards to private hospitals and private institutions. As a matter of fact, uh, the speaker was the former chair of the health committee. We were very close to actually having a hearing on this topic uh, until um, FEMA suddenly magically found the money because they didn't want additional scrutiny uh, because of the fact that they, short, they were shortchanging our health care uh, institutions. Uh, to summarize, uh, we secured a, I believe, a $1.6 billion uh, FEMA grant to all the health and hospitals that were impacted by Superstorm Sandy, of which about $923 million uh, was to go to Coney Island Hospital. Um, Coney Island Hospital, just so you're aware, I don't know if, if they've briefed you, has gone through a series of leadership transitions, which I find concerning. You know, I come from the public school system, I'm a former public school teacher, and if we had about three principals in about two, three years, that, that would be concerning. And I am concerned, and I'm not clear on where the recovery of our critical hospital stands. Um, we were promised, you know, to be briefed regularly, with regards to uh, not just the recovery of the hospital, but to make it more resilient. It was a big investment to create a new tower, to elevate critical infrastructure. Uh, there was also a commitment made uh, by the previous health and hospitals leadership to work with the community, to work with uh, local uh, Workforce One. We have a Workforce One program where qualified, credentialed uh, residents who have the skills and qualifications to be a part of certain uh, job sites can be a part of that process because this sh residents should not just be witnessing recovery, they should be participating in the recovery as well. That has not really happened. I know that a contract has been awarded to Turner Construction uh, to work on this, but that is where things stand. And we deserve and need more clarity about the recovery of, of, of Coney Island Hospital um, and the community engagement plan to brief us on where things stand and how will they fully engage the community. So I'd like to just to hear your remarks and, and your thoughts um, and uh, whether or not you will extend that commitment 
to engage with the community every step of the way in this recovery process. Well, thank you so much, Councilman Member, for your advocacy for that hospital. You know, that, that was the hospital that my family used growing up in Sheepshead Bay. So it has a very special place in my heart. Mm -hmm. And before I get to the construction issues, I just want to say, so I, I know about the history of Coney Island Hospital and its changes. I really do think it's having a renaissance. And one of the things, the, the best clues to me was that the medical staff themselves asked me to please appoint Dr. Terry Brady, the chief medical officer. It is very unusual for doctors to unanimously agree on anything. Um, and the fact that they came to me, each of them, and said, we want him appointed as chief medical officer uh, meant a whole lot to me. And I think he is an amazing physician. I also think that uh, Mr. Brown, uh, who was recently recruited, has done a great job. And part of my uh, focus to them is they need to see how important Coney Island Hospital is in the system. Unlike some of our other hospitals, there is no other major hospital, as you know, in southern Brooklyn, right? You have to travel all the way to Maimonides or Kings. And uh, the reach actually extends into Far Rockaway. So if you're in the Rockaways, you need to come all the way over across the Marine Parkway Bridge, Gil Hodges Bridge. So, you know, that hospital um, is incredibly needed, and it's also in an area where people are older, right? So it's a more illness. And so, you know, my vision for that hospital is that we grow the intensive services around, for example, angioplasty, the, the threading of catheters to open up blocked heart uh, arteries, as well as stroke care. Because if you look at the demographics of who's living there, and what are the urgent care that they're going to need? I don't want them traveling across Brooklyn where there's no freeway, right? You're either Belt Parkway, Ocean Parkway. It's not no fast way to Kings and Maimonides. So I have a very good sense of the clinical part, and I think that's something that, that, that we would be very consonant on and I could help. I have to say I know less about, I'm very interested, and I'm sorry to hear that the workforce hasn't gone well. Uh, and as soon as I go back to the office, I will ask. And I'm also, I didn't know that the briefings uh, had been promised and are not happening, and I will work on right. that. And, and I would say it's bigger than just the workforce piece. It's just we're not clear on where the recovery resiliency stands Understood, in general. Sir. And, uh, and I um, appreciate your, your roots from Southern Brooklyn a, a, as well, and uh, I would love to uh, visit uh, with you uh, on, a, on a good occasion to the hospital to, to see its progress. Great. And I, congratulations once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Since we don't have any slips filled out for comments from the public, we're now going to call on a vote for Dr. Mitchell Katz. Yeah, call the roll. Lee Martin, committee clerk, roll call vote. Chair Kozlowitz. I vote aye and congratulations. Gibson. Carnegie. I vote aye and also congratulations. Espinal. I vote aye and congratulations. Lensman. Aye. Torres. Traeger. Aye. Adams. Thank you, Dr. Katz, for all of the work that you've done thus far. I do vote aye as well. Speaker Johnson. I vote aye. At a vote of seven in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions, item is adopted. Okay. And now we'll proceed to our next nominee, Mr. Nathan Joseph, to the New York City Civilian Complaint Review Board. The CCRB has 13 members, five designated by the City Council, one from each of the five boroughs, five designated by the Mayor, one of whom is appointed CCRB Chair, and, it, and three designated by the Police Commissioner who must have law enforcement experience. Those designated by the City Council and Mayor may not have a law enforcement background. All appointees to the CCRB serve three-year terms. 
CCRB members may not hold any other public office, including public employment, and are compensated per diem at a rate of $315. The CCRB is authorized to receive, investigate, hear, make findings, and recommend action on civilian complaints of misconduct committed by members of the New York Police Department. Complaints within the CCRB's jurisdiction are those that allege excessive force, abuse of authority, discourtesy, or use of offensive language, including but not limited to slurs relating to race, ethnicity, religion, gender, sexual orientation, or disability. And I welcome you here. Um, raise your right hand to be sworn in. I welcome Mr. Joseph. Do you swear or affirm to tell the whole truth, the whole truth, throughout your testimony today? I do. Thank you. Okay. Do you have an opening statement? I do. Something for the marriage. <laughs> Good morning, Chair Koslowitz, Speaker Johnson, okay. <laughs> council members. My name is Nathan Joseph. I come before you today to be considered for appointment to the CCRB. You might ask why I want to be considered for such a position. Well, I'm a native New Yorker. I was born in the Bronx, and raised in Staten Island, and I still live there. I feel it's my responsibility to give back to the city that I love. I have worked in her prisons and her hospitals, taking care of those in need. It's what I love to do. I am retired now, so this is another opportunity for me to support and give back to my city. I have been in healthcare for the majority of my working life. I have worked as a dialysis technician, a physician assistant, and a facility administrator. Helping people is the thing that brings me the most satisfaction. It's not just saving someone's life or easing their pain or just helping them to have a better day today than they did yesterday. It's helping to train the next PA, doctor, or nurse, or helping a clerk realize their dream of becoming a social worker. I feel I have been given that opportunity again with this appointment to help people resolve stressful, emotionally painful situations in a different way through the CCRB. I know I can't cure every ailment. Life will definitely teach you that. But I welcome the challenge of helping those that I can and therefore and thereby give back to my city. I thank you for this opportunity and I'm ready for your questions. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to call on uh, Council Member Rose to say a few words. Yes. Thank you so much, Chair Kozlowitz, for um, convening um, this, this uh, meeting, this hearing. And um, Speaker Johnson, I really want to thank you for moving this appointment forward. This position has been vacant for more than four years, and um, I, I think it's a very important uh, position that should be filled. And I am pleased today to endorse the appointment of Staten Island resident Nathan Joseph to the Civilian Complaint Review Board. I have known Mr. Joseph for decades, well, actually, many, 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 many decades. <laughs> and I've found him to be always an intelligent, objective, and pragmatic person. Everything he has taken on in his career, he has performed with excellence. And I know he will do the same as the Staten Island representative on the CCRB. As a physician's assistant and a hospital administrator, Mr. Joseph has built his career making decisions that are sometimes life or death. His career has spanned medicine, data analysis, and hospital administration. In each of these capacities, he has demonstrated a keen ability to analyze empirical evidence and make decisions based on that evidence. I know he will use those same skills to weigh and analyze evidence to ultimately strengthen public safety and accountability, as well as raise the esteem with which we hold our law enforcement officers. Therefore, Mr. Joseph's skill sets make him ideally suited to represent Staten Island in this capacity. 
And so I heartily encourage my colleagues to join me in supporting his appointment. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I would like to ask a question. Do you agree it is necessary for the CCRB and NYPD to have a respectful working relationship? Absolutely. The only way we can succeed is that we have to work together and we have to work together with respect for each other. We can't have divisiveness between these two entities and expect to produce the results that the city requires and needs. Okay, and I see on your resume that you spend time working in detention centers. How has your work experience, particularly the time you spent in detention centers, informed the way you view law enforcement? <laughs> Interesting question. Um, what it really made me realize is that I don't want to go to jail. Um, it is not a very pleasant place. It's not a nice place to be. It also has allowed me to have a lot of respect for the challenges that law enforcement face, especially in the prison system. They might be in a block or a dorm with 21 inmates and there's only one officer. That is a huge challenge. You have people there that are angry, afraid, violent, maybe emotionally unstable. It's a very, very difficult job, a very, very huge challenge. And I respect those officers um, that they're able to do that and come in there every day and do that job. It is extremely difficult. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions from my colleagues? Seeing none and seeing the, no one filling out a slip to make a comment from the public, I will now um, call on uh, the vote for Mr. Nathan. Chair Kozlowitz. I vote aye. Congratulations. Thank you. Carnegie. With the glowing endorsement of Councilmember Debbie Rose, I certainly vote aye and also congratulations. Thank you. Espinal. I vote aye and congratulations. Thank you. Lanceman. Aye. Thank Tra you. Traeger. Aye and congratulations. Thank you. Adams. Mr. Joseph, uh, the CCRB has undergone several iterations over the past few years. I admire you for sitting in that seat. I thank my colleague, Debbie Rose, for her support of you, and I congratulate you. I vote aye. Thank you. I've heard that. Thanks. Speaker Johnson. Uh, Mr. Joseph, I want to thank you for the service uh, that you've given to the city and the healthcare field. I appreciate your comments here today, and I uh, thank you for uh, agreeing to put your name forward uh, for this position. And I look forward to, of course, a working relationship between all council members of this body and you at the CCRB. Thank you very much, and I vote aye. Thank you. Thank you. Matteo. Thank you. Um, Mr. Joseph, I look uh, forward to working with you. I, I thank you for your commitment and your service. I hope you take this appointment with an open mind. Um, unfortunately for the process, though, um, the majority of the Staten Island delegation was not in favor of the appointment, so um, I'm going to respectfully vote no uh, on M89. Gibson. I vote aye. We have a vote of eight in the affirmative, one in the negative, and no abstentions. M number is adopted by the committee. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And with that, Wait. Oh, yeah, it's called Matteo on, uh, yeah. on M77, Council Member Gibson. Matteo. Aye. M77 currently stands at nine in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. Okay, with that, this meeting is adjourned.